Gambia may be one of Africa's smallest countries, but it more than punches above its weight on the international stage. How are you? As say, not just because of its president's views on homosexuality or on relations with the West, but because of his ambitious plan called Vision 2016, which aims to make the Gambia self-sufficient in rice by the end of 2015. I'm Henry Bonsu, and this is Face to Face. Mr. President, thank you very much indeed for welcoming us to your country. Now, you're known for moving around in your pristine whites, but today they look very, very brown, uh, indeed full of mud. Can you explain why that is? First of all, I want to welcome you to the Gambia. Uh, the reason why I've changed color is because I've been working on my fields. I believe leadership by example. We've been importing rice for a very long time. And uh, despite the fact that we have so many hospitals and a lot of qualified doctors in the system, uh, people are dying like flies. We have various strange diseases that can only be attributed to what we eat. So in order to address that issue, we have to grow what we eat and eat what we grow. But Mr. President, in order to scale up, it's going to involve a change of so many different things, not least culture, machinery, output. How on earth are you going to do that? Well, it is a very simple matter. Uh, all we need is just small machinery. And then, of course, uh, the only time we need uh, machinery will be harvesting because you can see that uh, if we didn't have the number of people that are here, we still have, we'll suffer post-harvest losses. But what is more important is the determination and the political will to do so. If the, now the people are ready to do so because they now know it's possible. And they've seen me as the president walking there. Leadership, because if I talk and I didn't do anything, they'll say, oh, he's just sitting in the office and talking. So you're talking about leadership by example? Leadership by example. But to scale up from Gambia producing 15% of what it consumes in terms of rice to 100% by 2016, yes. that's a fantastic ambition. How on earth can you manage to turn around the current situation? in such a short time? Well, uh, the fields you are going, you've seen so far, this is just less than 25% of the fields that have grown, cultivated from May this year up to now. And so what we, what we have produced now, this year, is about 10% of the import. Uh, most of the imported rice in this country, 60% uh, of that is re-exported. So what we actually consume is about between 16 to 20,000 tons per annum. So the rest is re-exported. So to turn that around, if my objective is to, before 20, uh, by 2015, I would have had about uh, 90,000 hectares under cultivation. 90,000 hectares, let's say the lowest uh, uh, scenario would be five tons per hectare. That is more than what we need to feed this country. So we are going to, by the grace of the Almighty Allah, by 2016, I'm not allowing one grain of rice to be imported to this country. And I mean it, and I'm going to achieve that. Driving over here from Banjul, I saw plenty of land, green fields, arable land, but it didn't appear that much activity was going on on that land. That alarming. Mr. President, what's going on in those fields? Because they have already finished the harvesting of granules. Now, the only fields you go to and find activity going on would be millet and cruise farms and of course uh, 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 rice fields. But they have harvested, if you've looked at it, you have seen that they're st stacking their granules for tracing in order to winnow and sell. So there's a lot of activity going on. Also, these farmers, uh, they don't farm all the fields every year. They leave some fields to follow so some, and also other fields are left for cattle grazing and other ruminants. So uh, don't judge by the lack of activity that we've seen in certain areas because uh, now, okay, another thing also, I'm not, my agriculture is based on organic. We don't allow chemical fertilizers here. And no GMO, genetically no, modified organisms. No, we are organism. not going to do that because it's more hazardous. It's taking poison. We are not going to allow GMO when we can grow organic and feed ourselves. What about improving that value chain from the person in the field, the person processing, the person 
the middleman or woman, and then finally the person who wants to export. How does one improve those links in the chains so that one can see a real commercial business in the Gambia, as you see in India and Thailand, which end up exporting right here into the Gambia? Yes, uh, when you look at Vision 2016, we're not talking only about production, we're talking about processing. Because without processing, uh, the farmers become discouraged because like these farmers, if you tell them to grow watermelon next year, they're going to say, oh, the last year melon, nobody bought it. And nobody's buying it because the, the market is flooded. But if that was agro-processing, we could have processed it into something else. So agro-processing is an integral part of, of Vision 2016. We don't want to export rice, raw rice or whatever, unprocessed rice. Whatever we, exp we produce locally will be value added. We're going to process. So we're going to spend almost, uh, by the grace of the Almighty Allah, about $200 million in agro-processing and mechanizing ag agriculture, but basically in agro-processing because also mangoes, we have a problem. We import, uh, import a mango juice because more than a ton of fresh mangoes in this country. And that mango juice, if you look at it, is just made of mango flavor, but it's 90% water. I get the impression that this isn't just about healthcare, it isn't just about nourishment, it's also political for you. If so, explain how. Uh, Semi-political because the West is using food, as, food aid as a weapon as well. And of course also for your independence. Uh, with the flooding, weather change in, in the major rice producing countries, uh, if you cannot feed yourself, you cannot be independent. We are the ones who are advocating for 100% independence in whatever we do. And so for us to achieve that, we must eat what we grow and grow what we eat. There is also a, the health dimension of it. What we eat, if we know how it is grown, then we'll be able to control our health. Because without a healthy nation, Gambia can never be a prosperous nation. And how do we assure a healthy nation when we eat something that is grown outside and we don't even know how it is grown and grown mainly for export? But Mr. President, there are lots of international organisations that are aid and donors and partners with your own country. You point your finger at them, but they would say, look, we're helping the Gambian people. Why would you attack us? Where did they help us? They would say that they are giving food aid, they would say that they're giving budgetary support, a whole range of things that the IMF, the World Bank, the EU would say they want to partner with you in. They're not, they're not helping me. If the West refund to Africa what they have looted for the past 400 years, plus 25 interest, they're not giving us any aid. They're giving us back what, something that is infinitesimal compared to what they have taken from us. So they're not giving me any aid, they're not giving me any, any, any favours. They don't give me back what they've for, taken for 400 years and see whether I'll ask them for anything. So they're not giving me aid. In fact, that's even an insult. If you take a bull and then give me only the horns and you tell me you're helping me, that's an insult. Is that one of the reasons why you like to point the finger at the West so much? Because deep down you think they haven't repaired and recompensed Africa for what they've taken out over all these years. No, uh, that's not the reason. The reason is that the West has only been ungrateful. They, they were, abject poverty drove Europeans to Africa. And they exploited us for 400 years. In those years, there has never been any election. There were no parliamentary systems. To, after 400 years of looting Africa, they turned around. Some of us have to take off arms and kick them out. Now they come around and give us lectures about democracy and human rights. When in their own countries there's no democracy. Where's the democracy for blacks in the UK or blacks anywhere in Europe? Now, the, the, the so-called skinheads or neo-Nazi or the far right, if they were in Africa or, or in, in, uh, in the Gulf State, they'd be called terrorist organizations. And why are they not being called terrorist organizations and be dealt with? And they express the same hatred that uh, extremists also express towards humanity. They're all, they're all, and both, be it Islam, they call, those who call themselves Islamic extremists or those neo-Nazis and skinheads, they're all anti-human, they hate humanity. So why are those in the third world called terrorists and being bombed, and those in the West, the KKK in the United States of America, are called far-right and uh, uh, white supremacists? Supremacy who, against who? 
So I'm not anti West, I'm anti their hypocrisy and their racism. Your critics and critics of today's African leaders would say that most countries now have reached their golden jubilee. Your own country celebrates 50 years of independence in 2015, and they would say the fault is with you post independence leaders because you have been in control for five decades. What would you say to that? The British have been here for 400 years. They never taught us democracy. We never had one Gambian be a member of the British Parliament or the colonial parliament. And that's why up to today, Gambia, I have to build a national assembly. The first time in the history of this country that the national assembly is being built. The British never built a high school in this country in 400 years. So what, are they, what is there for them to teach me? They came to my country. There's a place around the Atlantic coast where 5 o'clock, 5 p.m., if you go there, they arrest you and lock you up a black man in our own country. So more than 1,000 years up to now, the West has never been democratic. And up to today, they are not democratic because if democracy is anything to go by, you have to respect the will of the people. Who do they think they are that they have to teach Africans how to be democratic when we have never colonized anybody? So this issue of Western democracy is a fallacy. It doesn't, it doesn't exist. How many blacks are killed in the UK and no investigation is, is done? If a black man is accused of uh, killing a white man in 24 hours, he'll appear in a court of law. Typical example. When the people rose up against the system because of pro police brutality in London, David Cameron called them gangsters and whatever. But when, and you can see the reaction, but when a, a, a black, two black men killed a, a soldier, they were asking for the death penalty. Can you see the difference? A black man shooting a white man would be arrested in 24 hours in the UK. But a white man killing scores of blacks will never be arrested in the history, in, in the next 25 years. Where is the justice? Let them, before you point finger at me, look at yourself first. If you live in a glass house, don't throw stones. After all, they came to Africa. We were better off than they were. We were better governed. Before they came to Africa, there were no prisons. There were no death penalties. Have you ever seen an ancient prison built by an African king or African leader? So they have nothing to teach us about democracy or administration. In fact, let them mind their own business. We mind our own business. Partnership, yes, but partnership based on respect. If they still think that we are slaves and they are masters, they are wrong in the Gambia, and I'm not going to compromise. But well, Mr. President, today's youth here in the Gambia, many of whom are unemployed, when they wonder why they're in that situation, they won't be pointing their fingers at the IMF, World Bank, the EU. Surely they'll be pointing their finger to you and say, Mr. President, where's my job? Well, even the Almighty Allah, who has everything, could have made everybody a wealthy person. But if you sit down and do nothing, obviously you'll be poor. Uh, and due to Western propaganda about African governments, they blame youth and employment on the governments of the day. Tell me one Western country where there's no youth unemployment. For the Gambia, I can defend myself because I have built more schools than the British would have built in a million years of colonizing the Gambia. I have made education virtually free, including university education. From 94 to date, I have sponsored more than 250,000 students, irrespective of their politi the political affiliation of their parents. And I'm making education accessible to even the son of a fisherman. That is what I can do, give you the skills, give you the tools. Now, if you sit down and think that you cannot be dirty because you are important, then it's up to you. I could have sat down and said, I will not lack food, but that will not take my country forward. And that's why I, I want Afri everybody to be dignified. But unemployment is everywhere. So let them not point fingers at us. And of course, 400 years of exploitation. What do we expect in 50 years for us to do? However, Mr. President, your critics, both 
in the Gambia and outside even both God, Gambian even God has a, critics and Western oh, yeah, I, say I'm not that although you have a program and agenda your people are not truly free they can't criticize you publicly they can't run their own media you still believe in the death penalty if one is a homosexual they have to flee the country and they say that tarnishes your record what do you say I don't care what they say Africans have never been homosexual. We have never seen homosexual frogs. I have cattle. I have never seen homosexual gay cattle. And homosexuality is, a, is detrimental to human existence. It's un-African, it's unethical, it's ungodly. Go to the Bible and the Quran. We are Muslims and we believe in the Almighty Allah and what he says. Whatever Allah says is haram. We will make sure it's haram to the letter. I don't care what they feel about me. I didn't introduce the death penalty here. I found it here. And the British brought the death penalty to the Gambia. Before colonialism, there was no death penalty in Africa. Don't you know that? Go to history. But it's also said now, that... Now who? It is also said, uh -huh. Mr. President, yeah. that it was the colonials who brought in the laws against homosexuality into Africa, and Africans have maintained and kept those laws. So to be truly African would to be to remove those laws forbidding homosexuality and to remove the death are you, penalty. Are you attributing that homosexuality is African? There are some Africans who say so. Uh, yeah. yeah. Now, in the, in the slave trade, doesn't Africans get captured people in the bush? So those, those are the same type of Africans that we still have that they use against us. So I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be surprised yeah, but homosexuality is un-African. And I, let me also make it very clear. Even if the whole world accept it, I, I, I will not accept it in the Gambia. They, let them go and tell me whatever they want to tell. Do I care? I don't. What I care about is how Almighty Allah sees me. I'm a Muslim. If I die, none of them can take me to hell or heaven. But it's the Almighty Allah who will take me to wherever he decides. And homosexuality would never be accepted in this country. They can call me any name. Do I care? I don't. Imagine, Mr. President, if you knew somebody, thought they were talented and they were even related to you, and that person presented themselves as a homosexual, said, I can't help it, it's how I was made, would you still condemn them or would you say, I must be merciful, beneficent, beneficent? What would you say? In applying the law, I have no relative. I have sworn to the Holy Quran that I will do my duties without fear or favor, ill will or affection. And I say, help me, God. I didn't say, help me, relative. And I didn't say that except my relative. I have sworn to uphold the laws and the constitution of this country to the letter, irrespective of who is involved. I have an operation called Operation No Compromise Against Corruption. I have sent people, of, uh, some of my brothers to jail for that. I don't compromise. I don't have one set of rules for the whole country and one set of rules for my family because we are all Gambians. I'm not even above the law of the Almighty Allah. So... Oh, I'll be very happy to see a relative and I will set an example. I have no Me example. Either. But there are many, many Gambians. Gambia has a yeah, good, yeah. strong diaspora yeah. in the States, in the UK, elsewhere. Some of them say they can't come home while you are president because they feel they will be detained because they've been in opposition, because they have a different notion of how the Gambia should develop. What would you say to those people? They are not in the Gambia, right? They're outside. They're outside the Gambia. And they say they are afraid of coming. But there are thousands of Gambians also who come here every December to, to celebrate uh, New Year and whatever. Thousands of Gambians in the diaspora. Those who commit offenses have no place in this country. And let me make it very clear. Let me make it very clear. You have about 2 million Gambians. And if you want me to sacrifice those two million Gambians, their well-being and their security and stability in this country, I will not. Yes, that's my philosophy. Yes. So they can stay there. They, they, why, if, why would they want to come to the Gambia if they think that where they are, they are free? Let them practice whatever they want. Okay? And most of those people are not, they have denounced their Gambian citizenship. Now, those Western countries want to use them against my country to destabilize this country, they will find me here. And that's why they are afraid of coming to this country. Mr. President, you are known to be a devout Muslim and Islam is very strong across Africa, but we have presentations of Islam in parts of Nigeria, other parts of 
West Africa and even in Somalia, which some find extremely terrifying and frightening. What would you say to those people who believe their jihad is one of bombing and killing? They are not Muslims. They are just criminals. They are a disaster to humanity. They are an insult to Islam and they should be wiped out. We're talking about the likes of Boko Haram. All Shabab. of them, I see they are all horrible agents of the West created to give to tarnish the image of Islam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam conducted his jihad. He never burned down one church. Remember the churches were there before the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, before Islam. He never killed the Jews. He only fought those who fought against him as he was preaching. And those who repented, those captured and say, La ilaha illallah, Sayyidina Muhammad Rasulullah, they were released. These people, should people that are say, La ilaha illallah, Sayyidina Muhammad Rasulullah, I'm a Muslim like you, for the sake of Allah and the Prophet, let me go. They execute people in cold blood. These are cold blooded murderers that have to be wiped out. They have nothing to do with Islam. So what type of jihad are these people talking about? They are false. They are criminals. And we will not tolerate them in the Gambia. And Mr. President, this is my second time in the Gambia and I see a country where a Muslim and Christian are in harmony. How do you maintain that given that not too far away there are all kinds of extremists who are looking for a new home? Well, Gambia would be the wrong place for extremists. We practice pure Islam. If there's anything that we call fundamentalist Islam, is us, the Gambians, which says absolute peace and stability, submission to the will of Allah. If you are a true Muslim and you submit to the will of Allah, you will accept human diversity because the Almighty Allah created us like that. If you come in December, you think that the whole country is, is, is Christian. You come during the month of Ramadan, you think that the whole country is Muslim. This is what we believe in living in peace according to the teachings of the Holy Quran. So they, if they are looking for a new home, Gambia is certainly off limits. We don't believe in hate. That is not a religion. We don't believe in killing innocent people at the market or bombing people in a mosque. And you call yourself a Muslim? Not even in a church. Killing innocent people. They didn't say killing innocent Muslims. They say killing innocent people is haram. What are people going to a marketplace how, what have they done wrong? School children, what have they done wrong? This is political, it has nothing to do with Islam. Until recently, people both in Africa and outside were saying Africa is rising, the continent is being uplifted. But because of what has happened this year with the Ebola crisis, they're saying maybe this rise wasn't quite so robust, quite so strong. Where do you think Africa is at this point? Well. There are powerful forces that want to see Africa fall instead of rise. And everybody is talking about Africa rise, and by the grace of the Almighty Allah, the rise of Africa cannot be stopped. But they do everything possible to make sure that each time we go forward, they, they bring us down. When Africa was so prosperous and they were so poor, they came and colonized us for 400 years and reversed our advancement. But this time around, whatever they do, they bring Ebola or any other virus, Africa is going to rise because that's what the Almighty Allah say, and we are going to rise up. So most of what they're talking about is even propaganda. Because look at how interesting it is. The origin of Ebola is then Zaire. DRC is the, one of the richest countries in natural resources. And then you look at West Africa, where it started Guinea. Guinea is West, uh, West Africa's equivalent of DRC. Sierra Leone, Diamonds, Liberia. So how is it possible that Ebola is only targeting mineral-rich African countries? There is somebody behind the virus. But also, it is very clear because this time around they got it wrong. You know why? Allah exposed them. How is it possible that whites, when they have Ebola, they are cured and Africans die like dogs? So this is the question I want to ask African. Africa will rise it whether the West like it or not. But we, the leaders of Africa, have to wake up. It's a question of leadership. President Yaya Jame of the Republic of the Gambia, thank you very much indeed for joining us on this edition of Face to Face from the Gambia. I'm Henry Bonsu. Thank you for joining us and keep on watching Press TV.